Hello and welcome to Kushti TV, the Straight Talking YouTube channel. Um, yes, what am I bringing to you as promised? The things, the many things you didn't know about the serial killer, the horrendous, evil serial killer, Levi Belfield. I'm going to explain many sides to Levi Belfield you didn't know. Um, from a very, very early start, I knew Levi. Um, I born and raised in West London, I'm from the Romany Gypsy Traveller stock. Um, how did I become um, from West London? Um, some 80 years ago, in the early mid 1940s, my great grandfather, Walter Smith, um, who were predominantly from London, Surrey, Sussex, bought some land here in West London, Middlesex, which is sort of um, barely on the uh, Surrey. Middlesex border. Of course, we're in the London borough of Elmslow. Um, yet, yeah, and that's how we got here. This land behind me um, was purchased by my great grandfather, uh, to say in the mid early 1940s, and then my grandfather had purchased it from his father. So it's been in my family, and it was licensed for two caravans. As you can see um, behind me, it's still got two caravans on. So. Um, it was owned to my grandparents and my aunties respectively. My, my parents, when travelling, will continue staying in neighbouring places such as Hampton, Belton, right here in Amworth, to be near his parents as we were travelling. So you were going to travel somewhere, um, he would go to his route. My dad was raised and schooled there, so he had many friends. So even though he was standing in a caravan, he'd, he'd be out drinking with his schoolmates who were in houses. So that was my early life, born in West London and raised around this area. Whilst my grandparents had settlement, we never in its infancy. But that's how it all started for me, right here, um, in this yard. Uh, it was home to the Romany family, the Ripleys, uh, and the Smith Stocking family. My great-grandparents had purchased it. And living right around the corner in Amworth here was the man in question the evil Levi Belfield. But what we didn't know, we knew Levi Belfield, but we didn't know it was evil. And um, allow me to take the journey around and unlock the key and show you the other side to the evil, infamous serial killer, the Levi Belfield. very earliest memories of Levi Belfield was right in this very spot this very spot here we would park our caravan on this park it's at Forge Lane in Amworth we'd park our caravan here yeah because um, there was a good opportunity we could stay here without interruption the reason being if you look at the houses behind us yeah my mum um, as I said earlier my dad was schooled in this um, village, London village, right? And he knew people, and he would all around the area, and um, he would go stay at Feltham. And incidentally, Feltham's up the road, a neighbouring town. And my mum would uh, befriend the non uh, gypsy girls in the houses. And incidentally, we would stay here because we had friends and and um, from mainstream life in houses at Feltham Football Club we called it and incidentally the, the sister there would be the sister a lady there would be the sister of a lady that lived right in this house here yeah um, uh, Gary Bairstow and Mickey Bairstow and the girls were, were friends of me and my brothers um, if I've got it rightly I think her name was June it's a long time ago and so there was a good chance they wouldn't complain to the authorities because we were friends so we'd stay here and right to the next house then was my good friend Jim Skelly an Irish fella who was a family friend so um, and one of the Wrights one of the Wright family yeah so there's a good chance that it was just Smithy camping up behind their house and it was all no trouble so we could stay on this very spot yeah for length of time we wanted really till we moved on uh, to somewhere else but um, so yeah and my dad would be here solo on his own on this very spot and it was in my very earliest memories at Levi Belfield's about two or three years older than me um, and I would have been maybe four, five, maybe five year old he'd have been say seven, eight yeah and that was my very earliest memories so I'm going to move on now and um, when we later got settlement 
of course my dad was harbouring the ambition to be around his parents, a place he always stayed. And um, just behind us, this park we used to play on, it's changed some description. Um, it's just modernised now, but we just had the old, the old stainless slide and the old swings and a roundabout was like the old fashioned park, yeah. So when my mum and dad, our family grew, we were looking for settlement. It was right here and I'm going to take you around to my house, yeah. And there was some other fellow Romanies in the road, but you can see the, uh, the road, the, the south road we lived, it goes in like a Q shape. I'm going to take you back now to my road um, where I then got settlement, incidentally the same road as where Levi Belfield and his family lived. So we're going to go around the corner. But this is my very first meeting place. And um, what was he like as a child? Nothing odd, because I used to play. He'd go to school, I didn't school. But he'd come back, play outside my caravan. We'd mess around in the park here and we'd just do things that kids done. Um, and it was just fun. And he was just another kid that I played with as I played with many of the kids become my friends from this estate, but as early back as that. But abnormal, nothing, just kids playing. Um, he just, he did have one, only one tendency, that he'd be there one minute and the next minute he'd vanish. He wouldn't say, see you tomorrow, he'd just go. And if he promised to see you at that time, you know, you could never rely on that. That was the only thing that was hot about him. You know, he would just vanish, disappear without saying, see ya. But when he was in company, nothing abnormal. So this was my house um, in South Road, Amworth, yeah, TW Postco, just near Twickenham, the famous rugby ground, right behind me, um, that was my house, um, home to my parents for some 38 years, and home to myself for a decade or so, well it was always home, because I'd always um, venture back to mum and dad, um, for whatever good excuse. So uh, yeah, for 38 years, the house just behind me in question, same road as where Levi lives. Um, yeah, so I'm going to take you around to uh, Levi's house, Levi Belfield, um, where he lived from a little boy upwards as well. So um, yeah, we've just walked a couple hundred yards around the corner and just right behind me is the house where Levi was back as a baby and raised in the same road as myself so you can see that else that was home to the serial killer from the little boy his mum Jean um, I knew um, didn't remember his dad Joe died um, I remember his death but I couldn't remember him he was friends with my dad and my grandfather respectively drinking in the local pubs so Jean, um, Levi's mum, she's quite a nice lady, um, quite quiet really, just sort of, um, yeah, just seemed quite a quiet lady, didn't really seem anything either way, um, nothing too different, just a fairly reserved, quiet person, a friend with my aunties and my grand. I remember when I lost grandparents, she offered an hand to help out, you know, because we we bring back our loved ones for a couple of days to um, mourn, um, respect, we call it sitting up, but um, she helped out with making sandwiches, making people comfortable and welcome. So that's as much as I knew of her, really. I really, really, really went in that house. Probably a couple times, I remember. I used to go round the back and into the kitchen, and that's the only memories I really have. Um, nothing too strange, really going into an house into a kitchen or sometime my um, gran and aunties would visit as she would visit them um, from the land the yard um, with the caravans that's from here probably from round here 400 yards just round a corner and say my house is a couple hundred yards um, so what will have some meaning I'm going to walk round the corner which is probably about 50 yards from my house and a couple hundred yards back round to Boyd Keppel's house, uh, who played a, a big role in um, the undoing of Levi Belfield, which I will come to. Let's go take a quick look at Boyd's house.
Yeah, so we just literally walk around the corner. If you look, just the house on the corner there, you can just see the top of the chimney. The next one round was my house. You can just see it from here. You'll just see my house, yeah? Okay, and this was owned to the once gangster Boyd Keppel, yeah? Um, a reformed character now, done lots of porridge to prove it, but it'd be some significance in this documentary to the house just here behind me where the palm tree is. Um, that was owned to the Keppel family, um, Boyd Keppel, and all will be revealed on what significance um, and how it unfolded in a lengthy prison sentence for Boyd. Okay, yeah, so we've got a picture. Um, this is where all the infancy, all the early stages, my knowing of the Levi. So we've now been some 14 years together which i'm now going to explain um the very next move the day i saved him being killed from a killer a killer was going to kill a killer if you like an already killer who become a killer was going to kill levi belfield and i'm going to explain that and take you to the once pub where it all happened So here, the flats behind me was once the Oxford Arms pub. So this was the Oxford Arms pub behind me, yeah? So just to give you a picture on where me and Levi Belfield were raised, um, you see the motorway just on the top there, yeah? That's the road into London, yeah? You go via Twickenham, Richmond, and then into London. We're 13 miles west of the city centre, right? It's a tough, rough town. It's a village really, like um, most of London is made up of villages. It's a tough, rough village. Just its nearest town centre is um, Ounslow, just two miles to the right. Just two miles this way, Ounslow. And we have just one mile as the crow flies behind us, Felton. Now what made it a tough, rough town, Anworth? Um, army barracks, there were barracks at um, Ounslow, yes, and Felton, just across Anworth Air Park, literally um, the barracks were almost in Amworth. It was right on the border. Part of the barracks were actually in Amworth. But what made it a tough, rough London village was the fact, yes, that, um, you know, young squaddies were young, fit men coming out and uh, they were looking for a fight and looking for local women. And that didn't sit too well with the locals. And they weren't having that very easily. This really, trust me, really was a tough, rough, hard part of London with barracks just to the right and now low and just as a crow flies over here in Feltham yes it was a tough rough town the Oxford Arms was one of eight pubs we also had the biggest carnival in Europe yes I mean the biggest we think about Notting Hill I think of Notting Hill was a big carnival but it was nothing to Amworth we had eight pubs around here in this tough rough village of Amworth yes eight pubs and it was in this very pub here yeah there were some tough, rough people, yes. The then landlord, a friend of mine, um, was a face and a tough man himself, Dave Christie. He was the landlord of this pub. On one occasion, I had a bare knuckle fight and the whole pub, this pub had closed. The whole pub went out to watch me fight in West London on a gypsy site in a bare knuckle fight. They loved it. So this little um, village, um, if you like, 30 miles west of London was owned to many tough, rough, hard men, right? Yeah, trust me, and um, villains and gangsters. Of course, I'm not going to reveal them, yeah, but this place was home to some tough, hard, rough men. Yes, some of the roughest, toughest, baddest men in London, this this very village, yeah? We also had dart champions, yes, we had two. That was, this had eight pubs, this little village, but this very pub was the incident um, we were brought up, we were talking late 80s, this was 1989, yeah, and um, there was a fella, said fella, in question, not going to reveal, he showed me he had a gun, he was a rough, tough, violent man, but not to me, he was a real friend, 
to me and my brother, we must have had a calm and influence. He had nothing to prove on us, me and my brother were knuckle fighters. We go all over different parts of London with this fella. And um, we never got, and we never saw the violent side to him. He was just our friend. We had a calm and influence, we had a right laugh and some good, good times. And if he's out there, I'm sure he'll remember my face. And I'm not gonna reveal his name. But what had happened, um, he'd lost a bottle of CS gas. So CS gas was, um, it was a legal thing, I'm sure you all know, probably know what it was, it was like a spray. And it was a good violence defense, so if somebody pulled out a knife or a bat or something, you could spray them and get out of trouble. Or some people just use it to, you know, just for the heck of it, um, for violence. But um, there was lots of gangs and tough stuff going on in the late 80s. And um, it wasn't a bad thing to have if you're around this stuff. And, and uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever way you want to look at it, we were caught up in quite a violent time and the person had lost a bottle of CS gas in the Oxford Arms here from his pocket I didn't know that but who um, offered me a bottle of CS gas I think it was for six pound in them days was none other than the evil infamous serial killer Levi Belfield do you want a bottle of CS gas I replied yes six pound and um, I purchased it and um, conversation went on. A couple days later, I met a fella that would go on to be a killer. And he says, I'm talking, I said, uh, I've got some CS gas. You bear in mind, we're only young, 1989, I'm 18 years of age. Yeah, so it's the sort of banter we're using. He said, oh right, so I showed him, I said, where did you get that gas from? So I bought it from Levi Belfield, not knowing that he had picked it up from his pocket yeah, as it had fallen out. So he started fuming and spinning on the floor going absolutely mad. I'm gonna kill him. I'm gonna fucking kill him. I'm gonna fucking kill him. He's gonna absolutely losing it, going mental. And I said, calm down. Calm down, mate. Add the gas back. I said, he's just an idiot. He might not have known it was yours. I said, he's not worth it. And he had a shotgun in tow. I knew that. I saw it. And he was gonna kill Levi Belfield and had I known I would have easily it's so so easy I would have easily just let him use a shotgun a murder serial killer who were innocent girls children and young women yes but um, some weeks later we go up the road um, heading out this part of town a bit deeper towards the city a town called Acton six seven miles up the road the same man just a few weeks later, that was going to shoot him dead in this pub, walked into a pub in Acton and shot a pub, a other fellow drinker, dead in a pub in Acton. Yes. So, he would have killed Levi Belfield. But silly old me, I had no knowledge, no knowledge at all of his antics. Yeah. Now, it's at this stage, but me and Levi, I um, move out the area for a while to, with some cousins and I, a few years later, I then marry and as does Levi, I believe and literally for 10 years I get married quite young I think as did Levi, sort of married or with partners, children and um, my wife is up the road in another part of West London just the other side of Ethro place called West Drayton so I frequent Amworth because my parents are here a lot of my old chums and mates but I'm now living over there Levi's goes about his stuff and I literally don't see him for 10 years and all the hundreds of millions of homes people living in the millions and millions of homes because uh, um, London's home to um, 11 million people and West London's probably got its 4 million or so proportion of that yeah of all the four million people living in various places some 10 years moves on and of all places where does Levi Belfield settle? right next door to my mother-in-law and father-in-law he then says some bloke knows you yeah and he said by the name of Levi just completely coincidental and then 10 year gap Levi then comes back in from that early upbringings in the same road to the incident in this pub we literally part company I don't see him literally don't see him for 10 years and of all the owns he moves next door 
to my mother-in-law and father-in-law and then we're going to take the story on from there so we've made um uh, we're just coming across the we, we've just left the london borough of Ounslow, um Anmouth, and where all this horrendous horrendous stuff started um, I've just come across the London, now the London Borough of Richmond in a place called Ampton, you're right. And um, yeah, when the very first knowledge, just at the top, a young lady by the name of Marsha McDonald um, got off a bus and walked down off a of Percy Road and walked down Priory Road here. And just behind me in the houses, somewhere here, um, she was making her way home and just yards, I think like 50 yards from her house, as when she sadly, sadly, um, the met her death at the hands of this most horrible, horrible person that didn't know that as an horrible person, sadly. Um, it happened just behind me on the other side, just 50 yards from a parent's house. Um, and a beautiful young Marsha McDonald with a whole life ahead of her um, was friends of friends. Um, I can't say I knew the girl at all, but I do know she's a friend of a friend um, still now. In fact, the Keppel family, she was friends of one of the girls, one of 12, the Keppels, and um, yeah, she's um, friends of one of the girls. This beautiful young girl with a whole future ahead of her, just 50 yards or so from her own, approximately in this area. Um, she met the most unsuspecting, cruelest, evil, end and I've got to be honest um, from a journalist perspective I'm in an area here a little uncomfortable feeling terribly sad for what happened to this beautiful young woman with all the ambition of career traveling the world meeting the boyfriend husband building the family all of those things she had snatched away from her and it's it's difficult um, to be honest um, as a journalist it's very difficult to to, to be here and it's just a mile and a quarter from the road we lived in so we know this area well we used to walk around these streets we knew it like the back of our hand as did the horrendous evil killer in these situations the first thing we must be very very mindful and respectful for the parents and for the sad young woman that lost her life I'm going to take this opportunity, this is where it all started, this was the first known attack, whatever this horrible man was doing behind the scenes, nobody really knew, but what we did know is this was the first known attack, I'd like to take this moment to be ever so respectful to the parents, to let them know that I'm still feeling for them as a parent I am now, um, my daughter that's filming this and um, my filmer and editor, my daughter Louis, would have been a very similar age. Um, she's a young blonde girl, my daughter, as was this beautiful young Marsha McDonald, the young blonde girl. So obviously I can't put myself in the position of what these parents have gone through, the worst imaginable grief. Um, but I do have daughters of a similar appearance and age today and you know it, it doesn't even bear thinking so I'd like to take this moment to say a prayer just right in the vicinity I pray for the safe keep of the beautiful young girl that lost her life and I pray for the parents to continue with strength as the best they can in their very difficult life cut short at the hands of the most brutal evil serial killer yeah we've been to the scene um, where young Marshall McDonald cruelly cruelly matter end yeah now I'm here at the very scene where the French student Emily Dollagrange so sadly had met her end um, in the same circumstance she was drinking just about um, three quarters of a mile um, we're here in Twickenham for those of you who don't know it's the home of the England rugby yeah 
and that for me and um, Levi Belfield would have been one and a half miles, maybe two miles that way. So it's an area we really knew well. Um, there's a wine bar there called Manhattan's and they've got many different um, names over its duration but it was owned by an ex um, southern, area, southern area boxing champion Wally Anglis who I knew a bit mate of mine from around the boxing scene nice fella Wally he owned a white bar wine bar there in Emily Dollagrange um, at the age of 22 she was come over from France um, enjoying this beautiful side of London as you should she has a night out in the wine bar yeah and I think um, she opted to get a bus or a cab and they weren't coming along it was something along those lines and she made her way up and across the green here yeah and um, she was heading in this direction just the other side of me is Strawberry Hill and Fallwell and Hampton not sure where she was living but that she was attempting to get home and um, again I can't emphasize the words enough for this man under these circumstances you've got to bear in mind still at this stage zero clue yeah we've now left our area here myself yeah and Levi he's now living next door to my father-in-law it's about then three quarters of a mile round the corner from me yeah but this is the second beautiful young girl from Wally Anglis's wine bar Manhattan's makes her way across the green and I think it's approximately around halfway here this poor soul without warning he parks his vehicle over there evidence later proofs and strikes her without warning now for me I've got two daughters and one at the age of 23 and one at the age of 19 both blonde girls and the age of Marshall McDonald was 19 and the age of Emily Dollagrange was 22 so it could have been anybody's daughter anybody's daughter and I'm um, again it's quite difficult to think that a young lady that's come over here as a student to enjoy London trust me this is with vast predominance if we can eliminate the horrible people of the world which we'd like to think a few and far between of Levi Belfields this is a beautiful side of London it's an absolute glorious side of London you, you really can't beat it it's a lovely lovely place to be she must have just enjoyed herself bless her and again what was her dreams did she meet somebody she liked that night or was she planning a career where was the next travel how was she enjoying London you know settling down with an husband all of these things lay ahead of her and so so sadly wiped out by this evil evil man without warning struck on the back of the head here so again right at this scene it's quite eerie there's people around here now everyday life is going on as it has to but so so sad i think around midnight maybe past midnight this young girl so i want to take this moment um, to this beautiful person again I pray for her and I save keep I pray to the good Lord has a resting place for her eternally and I pray for her family and their very difficult struggle again to move on so as a mere uh, it's quite a difficult place to be in that sense it's a beautiful place you could you could be anybody here laying around just love it enjoying it as people are but when we come here reporting as a journalist in this sense it's just so so sad this beautiful young girl has just taken out the most gruesome wicked circumstance so again always knowledge um, of fault for the victim and the family god bless Emily dollar grange we're going to move up the road now and um where somebody and escape well they didn't escape they got bludgeon over the back of the head and confusion i'm going to go just up the road around the corner again another part of london bear in mind we now moved about eight miles still about 13 miles west of london we are but we've more moved sort of circled round a bit we're about eight miles away from uh, in west Drayton, but he knows the area as do i because we're brought up here 
and um, he's then soon going to take his killings and attempted killings um, back over the other side of London as well. But I'm going to take you now to a place nearby where the actual penny dropped. The only knowledge I ever had easy after the event when they went yes, the police said something and the penny dropped. And I'm going to take you to a place of an unnamed young lady, unnamed, yeah, um, who very, very nearly met the same horrendous fate. She was just lucky. Luckier. She wasn't lucky, but she was luckier. She escaped and survived. And that's where the penny dropped. I'm going to take you there. She's around the corner, Strawberry Hill. In the meantime, yeah, as we leave this place, again, once more, fault for Amelie de Grange. Yeah, so um, here we are. Now, this is a victim of what we knew then is the Amar 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 murderer and the bus stop killer with various names because he's seeing young girls attempting to get bus at IA bus stops or on buses. Um, the young Marsha McDonald was seen on a bus late at night coming back from Kingston, a nightclub I believe, I'm not sure, but um, on the 111 bus which is the London um, which was the Armslow to Kingston bus and she was seen um, solo or very little getting off the bus he spun around um, I think he'd seen Emily Donna Grange um, at a bus stop or attempting to get one again um, she made her way across the green that we know we've just explained this young lady was never named um, She's possibly maybe watching this stuff, maybe not. People don't know her, I don't know her name. Um, but just behind us as the crow flies is the Fallwell bus depot. So it's the, it's, a, it's a depot really that takes you all around at Hampton, Richmond, um, Kingston, Hampton Wick, Teddington, Twickenham, Strawberry Hill. We're all in that little vicinity. That's their bus depot. Yeah. Um, and she, the reason a penny dropped is a rememberable night for me. Um, I'll explain it, please allow it to, but anyway, it's around midnight. She gets off the bus somewhere near the depot, maybe even at the depot, and she makes her way down. Um, we've only probably, as the crow flies, uh, three quarter of a mile, probably half a mile from the murder scene of Amelie Dollagrange, and maybe two miles that way of the murder scene of Marsha McDonald. Now she comes down around this road, she enters at the top here and I believe she's making her way down this road somewhere I think possibly on this side. We're now in a little corner called Strawberry Hill. Remember London's all little villages. We're a little um, Strawberry Hill's just here with sort of Teddington's right there, Twickenham's right there, full well all little all little pockets of villages again we're in the beautiful side of West London and we're here at Strawberry Hill and she walks down this path I believe I'm, I'm fairly certain it's here um, leading to newspaper reports remember this didn't end in death this young girl knows no knowledge of what happens no knowledge at all she wakes up she goes to West Middlesex Hospital in Isleworth yeah and so what happened? I don't remember. I don't remember anything. I was walking home. It's midnight. It's New Year's Eve. So the doctors decide that she has no knowledge. She's fell backwards on the icy, snowy weather. Smashed her head, but she's recovered. Thank God she's recovered. It's only when the murders start unfolding of Marsha McDonald, Emily Donagrange, the attempted murder on Kate Sheedy um, up Isleworth, where I was born, probably three, four miles from here, again, all on the same turf. She was run down. She came off a bus, making it home, minding her own business, bless her, smashed into with a car, reversed over with a car, howled abuse, hatred towards these pretty young girls doing nothing wrong with all their lives ahead of them, as was this young girl unnamed. It's only when all this stuff started unfolding, yeah, that they put two and two together and come up with four. They went back in the re 
um, examine the x-ray results and at this stage they said this young lady on this path here yeah I've been struck with a blunt incident and they changed their opinion and they said it was an attack of evil serial killer Levi yeah. Belfield yeah no I'm gonna leave this side of London now and we're gonna head over yeah to the side of London now where he's residing where he takes another attack on an innocent beautiful young lady this time um, the other side of London a European lady um, her name will come to me I'm gonna take you to the scene again she was innocently sitting on a bus stop but for this side of London we now have at least four attacks two ended in murder two very nearly ended in murder this is what we know of um, just up the Uxbridge Road in Ampton Hill again about one mile from here on own, own turf he knew all these roads as I know them because we're brought up here you know I don't want to go on about this but it's easy he knew all of this stuff it's his area and he attempts he comes from behind an edge behind an house on the Uxbridge Road in Ampton Hill just here and attempts to whack what he thinks is a female it turns out it's a male being the coward he was he backed off from the male and I don't know if it was was he in fear or wasn't what he wanted but he's hitting these people without any motive we know that he later on had a motive to kill the young schoolgirl, but at this stage two and two weren't put together because the MO was totally different these girls were struck from behind without warning for no apparent reason yeah so much so they built a criminal profile of um, they built a profile of the person they're looking for and they thought it was somebody who maybe has sustained an head injury and this is where my friend yeah an ex-gangster yeah become victim of a car crash and locals then entailed him in saying well, he had a car crash, he's got some mental issues, well thank God Boyd's made a good full recovery, but I was at his bedside when he nearly died, yeah, we thought he was going to lose him, we, we thought we were losing a friend, we thought our mates were losing family, I was at his bedside, he recovered, yeah, but what had happened, the press, I put, um, built this profile, and locals were going, this bloke fits the, fits the description, you know, he's a gangster, and he's got some, some injuries going on due to a car accident. So he gets arrested. All the tabloids, all the press, man arrested for murder. So they now think it's Boyd Kepler that lived in the very road, as we've explained, to both me and Levi Belfield. Yeah. But what happens, of course, it's not Boyd Keppel. But when they pull him in, they take his DNA for one of the most serious crimes, arguably since the Yorkshire Ripper. Yeah. Right, one of the biggest man hunts, maybe from the York, Jack the Ripper. It's, it's that big, it's up there and out there. They've got this lunatic going around killing people. When they discover it's not him, they've taken full test DNA and then self of London, a robbery had taken place, an armed robbery, and some blood was left at the scene, left at the scene of Boyd Keppel. Yeah, which then results in Boyd Keppel arrest for an armed robbery. He's in recovery mode at this stage. He shouldn't have stood trial really, because he's not fully fit at this stage. And the trial takes place, and Boyd gets 11 years. Yeah. So nobody was hurt in the robbery, nobody at all. But through, he didn't have chance to stand trial. He didn't have chance really to say his piece, because he was recovering, he wasn't fit. After the head injury he got me, but he got 11 years. So other than all the other victims, Boyd Keppel got 11 years without hurting anybody. So let's say if he did do the crime, we could dress it up. Let's say he did. Um, he was guilty of it, but did he do it? You know, he was struggling. Didn't have his chance in court, let's say that. But he didn't hurt anybody, and as a result, it could have been just a crime he'd have got away with without hurting anybody, but he got 11 years as a result. So victims, um, innocent, and somebody got 11 years in prison for um, the wrongdoings of Levi Belfield shone the torch on him yes 11 years would never have crime was gone done dusted 
it's never been caught. Yeah, so um, what we're going to do from here, we're going to move over the other side of London, and that's got our London Borough of Hounslow and London Borough of Richmond areas respectively covered. We're going to go to the London Borough of Illingworth. Yeah, so right on his very bus stop, um, there were two attacks that um, he got acquitted for that got unsolved. But we know it was him. You know what the um, the system's like sometimes. Uh, it has to be politically correct, if you like. Um, a young 17-year-old girl in Witten, which is um, just the side of London where we've come from. So around the Emily Dollar Grange, which is Kate Sheedy, Marsha McDonnell attacks. Um, Anna Marie, I'm just sitting on a bus stop like this. Anna Marie Rennie, 17 year old, brutally attacked but survived, thank God. Um, just as the same, we've now come across basically, we're right here at Ethro, you can probably hear the planes in the background going off. But um, yeah, so I'll keep my voice raised here. We're right at Ethro, yeah? So basically, what we've done, for you people who are not familiar with the area, we've just come across. We're in the London Borough of Elmslow, that side of Heathrow, on, on the edge of the London Borough of Richmond, and we've just come over. We're still in the London Borough of Elmslow, this side of the airport. Um, we're about to go to the London Borough of Illingdon. We're right on the border. But on this very bus stop here, this very bus stop, sat a 34-year-old Imra Dragoshi, yeah? Minding her own business. And he just pulls up, I think, a van or, or a car, gets out and just smashes the 34-year-old girl, lady, woman, in the head. Thank God she did sustain bad injuries, but she recovered, yeah, on this very bus stop. So this was his pattern. It was either a bus stop or he'd see a bus, a victim on, just about to get off. This was his pattern, hence the bus stop killer, yeah, right? But on this very, very bus stop, the same thing happened. They were either sitting on the bus stop, something like this, this poor girl, just waiting for a bus. You can imagine it. Can you imagine a lone female just waiting for a bus like this? And then, you know, probably half of my body weight and a big man of my size comes up and just smashed straight over the hip of our water. So, at this stage, um, we've pretty much painted the picture of the crimes that he had done. Um, arguably, and arguably, <clears throat> It's probably, it's probably not, it's probably, I shouldn't be saying this, another horrendous crime. And I was about to say arguably even worse, but they're all horrendous crimes, so they can't really, they're all in the same pattern. But um, at some point during this time, around this time, around the time, this is one of the latter attacks on um, Imra Dragoshi. This is one of the latter attacks, and I think it was around this sort of time that he goes probably about six miles from where we're brought up in Anworth, West London, not from here, to a place called Walton and Weybridge, where he abducts and brutally murders um, poor little schoolgirl, Lily Dowler. God bless her. Um, again, we have to... Um, we're not in that area, as I was with the others earlier, as I just said. We're, we're up the road a bit, but as we bring her into focus, we have to pray for that poor little girl. I pray for his safe keep. God has found an home for her. I pray. I pray for the family, for that, that horrendous struggle to move on. So forever mindful of the victims, including poor little Millie Dowler, killed in different circumstances, abducted, murdered, and the horrendousness, what happened at the hands of this horrible evil man, we don't know and we don't quite really want to know but we know it was a wicked wicked ending and a life ending but it was around this time so, yeah so here is the place where i used to do my training um right here this was a gym yeah it was uh, once called morley it then become spring elf and um we had our own boxing section within this gym and um it was this very place I started promoting unlicensed fights and of course I was a fighter myself. Um, some of the venues actually was just over here, we, we um, promoted just here in the um, Thistle Hotel. But all our training was done just right here. And in this room on the side, just here, yeah, 
We had an upstairs studio just here, yeah? So it, it was here in Longford Village. Um, what had happened, I once gave him a clump um, in a calf. He come in and um, Levi was acting, I was on gout and I was in pain. And I'm far from a bully or anything like that, far from it. But um, I was fit, training, uh, but I had gout, so I was in pain and discomfort. So um, he come in this cafe and said he was a top man around town. And he was no threat in that sense. He was threat to women, which we didn't know, but he was no threat to proper men. So um, he was being quite cocky in front of others and I was just in a bit of discomfort. So I leaped off on one foot and gave him a clump and knocked him over the table, knocked all the egg and bacon out of his mouth and gave him another clump, knocked him across another table, just with an open hand slap. Um, and that deterred him and uh, just, just, he just walked out, I just walked out the calf and just see him as a pathetic idiot in, in the fighting man sense. But something here in Longford Village when I was training, in this building behind me, um, I sensed him as a bully. I had sensed nothing at all of him being an evil, killer of innocent girls, women and children because of course um, young uh, Millie Dowler was just a child wasn't she and they're all young women. He, he was a bouncer remember and um, I just sensed something I can't remember now we're talking 20 plus years ago probably about 20 years ago now I'll give or take but I can't remember but I sensed something he was a bully and I had him on one of my unlicensed um, fights because we did have some novices on there. We had good ex-pros and fighters. We did have some novices on there and he was on one of them. And he used to come up to try and gain some, a bit of practice and he didn't train particularly hard at all. Not like myself and others were full-time training professionals. But um, it was here I decided that I'm going to pay this bully. And we're at a studio, not a boxing ring, a complete studio upstairs. And I let loose and I tore into him and I was had him and I was going to knock him out cold because I sensed he was a bully, not a killer, nothing like this. So I, I went in with some barrage of punches. He was a fairly big old lump, similar size to myself, give or take, maybe a bit smaller. And I went into him and I'm crashing punches at him, crashing punches, two, three. And to tell the truth, he didn't go down, but he was about to. I was whacking him around the head, around the jaw, and one of my mates jumped in and he said, stop, Steve Huff. A, a fellow friend from boxing, he just said, stop, you'll kill him. But I really intended and leaving him completely out cold, right, completely out the game, obliterated. And that's what would have happened. I didn't knock him out with the first three or four punches. I hit him around the head. But what was ironic, afterwards, yeah, he said to me, will you bear in mind, he's whacking people over the head with hammers, innocent women, yeah, right, will you bear in mind you know, the physical trauma bringing them to their deaths and serious injury, if you bear that in mind, he actually said to me, and these things stick in my mind forever, he said, I don't know how you boxers get it around the head. He said, because the punches you give me to the head, he said, my head has been pounding for three or four days. Yeah, and I just don't know how you withstand the punishment. So here is a man complaining about getting punched with boxing gloves on. Yeah pain it caused him to the head but beyond that he could inflict an hammer to the head of young innocent women and that always stuck in my mind this horrible evil killer bully couldn't take a punch to the head yeah certainly didn't want to um, without the discomforts of it but he could go in it innocent young women over the head but it was right here where again, somebody come to his, you remember back in the pub, I come to his rescue, somebody was gonna kill him. This time somebody come to his rescue from me. Who knows? If I put three or four more punches together, I could have killed him. And that would be horrendous in the terms of sport, but to kill a bully, serial killer, I may well have done it. Who knows? He'd have certainly been in some serious more trouble had it not been for the mutual friend. He got saved his bacon right there in Heathrow, in this gym. So we've fairly painted the picture of all the stuff he had done. I painted the picture where I'd saved his bacon, somebody saved his bacon from me. We've painted this picture. But now what I want to do, I'm going to move on. I'm going to take you to his house, yeah, and we're going to have an interview with somebody, right, 
and I'm going to tell you about the man next door. Literally, the man next door. And stuff that I will bring to your mind, um, bring to light, into focus. If you saw it in a horror movie, you would think it's too far-fetched. Trust me. Now I'm going to paint a picture of what the person was like without the mean demon in the bully, without me giving him a clump in the calf, without me saving his bacon. Let me paint the other side because there's always other sides. In fact, you couldn't have been what he'd been if he never had another side to him. So I'm going to now go to his new home, next journey, and I'm going to paint a picture of the man next door. We've heard that saying. It's literally like the man next yeah, door. Right, so we've seen the horrendous crimes. Now, you remember earlier on, I said, of all the millions, approximately four or so million people living um, in West London. Yeah? Of all places, right behind me is his house. And just to my right, as I'm pointing behind me, is my in-law's house. He moves right next door. So we've painted the, cr the criminal. Now let's see the other side to him. The, literally the boy next door. So it was right here in the house behind me where he was hiding in the attic when he got arrested. Yeah. And out here, right out, just right where this van is parked, was a mobile 24-hour police digging site, forensic site. They even had their own mobile coffees and burgers. They were here that long. In fact, my mother-in-law was making them tea and coffee at this stage, yeah? All right, she was a friend of Levi's. Something I'm gonna to touch on. So is the bad side to the man. Now, what was he actually like? He lived in here with his nice wife then. Um, was she common law wife or by deed? I can't remember, but she was a nice girl. I don't wanna reveal her name. Um, and he had two lovely children in there and they were beautiful children, one boy, one girl. I don't want to reveal their name, of course, for the protection. They've got to move on with their lives the best way they can, and I wish them well in that, of course. But they were lovely children. She was a nice wife. He was a character. Well, I knew him, I knew him as a womanizer. I wasn't sure if his wife was aware of that. Uh, arguably, she was. Arguably, she, she weren't. Um, he was a nightclub bouncer. Um, he once had, um, I wouldn't say it was a fling, but he, he was in national papers. A very, very famous star once had a bit of a... Um, I cuddle with him in a kiss in one of the nightclubs where he was a bouncer. I'm not going to mention her name, but very, very famous in this very day. So yeah, he was. Um, he liked the bird. A lot of people did, and I wasn't going to be too judgmental. Where if his wife knew that was their business, their marriage, none of my business. But the other side to him, a kind enough fella. Believe it or not, he was. I mean, we've got to remove the evil. We got to remove the evil serial killer here because we didn't know. I mean, we've got to see the other side of the picture. Otherwise, it's pointless me doing this documentary. If you go and just read the tabloids, we know what he is. But the documentary is about giving us an insight where we're from, where we met, what was he like? Yeah, so trust me, if he had a hundred pound in his pocket, he'd give you 51 at least. All right, so he didn't have any, he wasn't at all greedy in this sense. Um, his criminality was, well, he, he probably had a criminality side, but he didn't, it was, he was a bouncer, a clamper. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Um, if he'd done other criminality, I wasn't aware of it. Um, you know, um, he, wanted, he was like a wannabe hard man, and we saw him as a laugh. I'll give you one example. Um, when he come on, um, me and the late Brian Sonny Nichols, the hard man, friend of mine, um, we used to train together, actually boxed each other together. Brian, um, he said he's going to go in the post and me and Brian uh, joint promoted a show in Uxbridge, not far from here. And he said, I want to go on the poster as Mad Dog 501, Levi 501, Mad Dog. Well, now looking back on it, could we have seen something? He wanted to be known as Mad Dog. Unusual name for a fighter, isn't it? Really? Well, I suppose, I don't know. Maybe fighters have strange names. But looking back, was there something in, was the method in the madness there? Literally, he wanted to be known as Mad Dog. What me and Brian took him so seriously, you know, sarcastically seriously, hence, we said, we put him on the bill with Mad Pup 501. Yeah, that's how seriously we took him. He was a second-rate um, wannabe 
uh, hard man on the fringes of criminality. He, he was a, um, a wannabe and he was never taken serious. Not by any of the boys who were half serious, if that makes sense. But um, never ever seen him inflicting any violence, ever. Feared of a fight. Um, went on the unlicensed boxing scene, wouldn't stop holding. Was in more fear of anything, was trying to do it for his ego. But he wasn't there. He just wasn't there. He was more of a laughable character in the hard man field. Yeah. But he had a good sense of humour. Talking about laughable, he would give you literally half of what he had. And he had a witty sense of humour, which was a good sense of humour. Um, example, my wife's birthday one night, he turned up in a brand spanking new BMW. Brand spanking new, out of his financial um, reach. Because he never held on to money. Whatever he made, he got, he, he got rid of. He really, he really wasn't greedy with money. You share it and give it. His financial, it was out of his financial depth, and it was my wife's birthday, and it was a beautiful convertible, brands making a new BMW, and my wife said, Levi, there he comes, so he comes in the beer garden with his wife, so his wife sit with me, my wife's now gone in the car with this serial killer, but he was, as I say, he wasn't somebody we hated, he was like a, more of a friend, at this stage, of course, even though I had a couple of times when I, he reared me up and whatever, but all that was gone and forgotten about. Um, yeah, so this particular day, he comes in, gives my wife a kiss on the cheek, a normal sort of kiss on the cheek, gives her a hundred pound, I mean, 20 years ago, it's quite a few bob. It's probably like two and a half hundred now or something. Oh, that's for you, we insisted, sit there. come on, don't be silly, but I insist, it's your birthday, you have this. He then said, oh, I love your car, Levi, I come for a ride in it. So it takes my wife around the block in this car, turns out to be stolen. <laughs> in the car, He's got a policeman's uniform in there. So he's seen, I had the impression he's stolen the car from a policeman. Which was something we can touch on later. Did he have any, did he have some insight knowledge with the police? Something we're going to touch on. But as a character, um, he would, my wife <laughs> went in the car with him around the block. He would come in my house, knock on the doors. Joey, no, we'll just come and have a cup of tea. Not in any fear of getting bludgeoned over the head or anything like this. Yeah. That's just what it was. He knew my wife. Camping trips, like, like in caravans, tie them up the coast. Um, good times. His children, my children, nice. It was just, it was just strange. Every now and again the curtains would get pulled in the house three or four days ago by and it'd be almost like it was non-existent. That would happen. That would happen. Just how he would do a disappearing act as a little boy with me. He just wouldn't be anywhere to be seen. So that was the sort of, um, but other than that, there was nothing strange, nothing at all. I thought he, he was in too much fear of, I thought he was would maybe even wince at the sight of blood or something. It wasn't really, you know, I really didn't see the other side. It's easy to say now, but I just didn't see it. Um, I'll give you one example. In a minute, I'm going to go in and have a chat to a lady that knew him well. Um, that even was his next door neighbour, being my mother and all, even when it was all in the tabloids and papers he was charged with murder, she still never believed it. Yeah? Now you think I thought I was a streetwise guy. I thought I was. Um, but I would have had him down as you, my brother, any other normal bloke as a serial killer. He would have been excluded just like the rest because I knew absolutely zero, nothing at all. Um, as I say, I've got a little bit of a wind of bullying. I think it may have come from a club door or, um, or what he had done. I got a bit of a wind of that, but I thought that was possibly in his makeup. If he could overpower a bloke and get a bit of notoriety, it might be good because he couldn't get it on a fair playing field. And that's when I attempted to give him the clump. Something come in my knowledge but to her women children just never ever saw it um yeah so he's doing he was also that's the other job he had he was an handyman builder he could lay slabs and things and he wasn't too bad as a diy man and he's doing my mum's bathroom tiles now listen to this when i say if this happened in an horror film you would cringe and think it was far-fetched 
Now we're back to Amworth, that side of London. Yeah, in my mum's house. He's taken off the bathroom tiles. Now, massive attacks, killings and attacks going randomly around their area. And they're advised to lock their doors. My mum rightly does. My mum actually says to him, right, Levi, how are we doing upstairs in the bathroom? Because, um, and I better lock the door by the way, because the hammer murderer is about. Now, as my mum locks the door, Levi standing three steps above, he's come down for a cup of tea, wielding a claw hammer. So my mum's saying, we better lock the hammer murderer out, Levi. And he's standing three steps above my mum's head, wielding a claw hammer. Now, if you saw that in a movie, you'd say, too far fetch. My mum's known him from a little boy. Clearly, 100%, no fear. It's not Levi Belfield, the serial killer. No way. In fact, we lock him in the house. And my mum, all the time, didn't know that she's actually locking the hammer murderer in her house. They're standing three steps above her, wielding the hammer. My mum had no clue. Absolutely zero. So this is the thing he had over on people. Not only women, us as men. We thought we were streetwise people. I thought me and my brothers and the friends and cousins and all the people around me, I thought we really were streetwise blokes. And I thought we would have sniffed out something wrong. But anyway, we're going to move on. That was him, a very witty, jokeable bloke. Seriously, had a good sense of humour, had, had a heart of gold in the sense of sharing things, yeah? But serial killer, no way, didn't have it. But we're going to go in, have a chat, and um, we're going to unfold um, the time when the penny dropped. It was right there, right in this house when the penny dropped for me, the first and only thing. So let's continue, let's go and have a chat and then we'll wind it down to the finish, to when the penny dropped. Right, so um, this documentary is um, about the serial killer Levi Belfield, yeah? And um, the boy next door. I've dubbed it the boy next door, the man next door, because he lived to you, um, he lived in my mum's road, but he lived next door to you for eight years. Just tell us um, what sort of fellow he was like, as you knew him. Let's forget about what we know. As you knew him then, what was he like as a person? He was a lovely fellow. Was he? Yeah, gentle. Yeah. And that, he was like Jekyll. Well, I think, after they told me what he's done, I thought to myself, well, he's like Jekyll and I, didn't he? Absolutely. Hundred percent. You couldn't spoke a truer word. That's exactly what he was. He was like Dr. Jack or Mr. Right, wasn't he? That's right. But before we knew that, for the people at home, I'm trying to paint the picture of how he fooled me as a man, but he fooled you as a woman. Because sometimes women sense more things than men, but you didn't sense nothing. nothing you thought he was a nice fella. I thought he was the loveliest fella, and a good neighbour. Yeah. But what could you do, Jay? Would he come in for tea and all that and dinner? He'd have dinner, he'd sit there with Louise. Yeah. And he'd have a bit of dinner and a cup of tea and he'd yeah. sit there waiting till John when he visited all the family like Christine, yeah. Maria and my Johnny. Yeah. He visited all them at night time. Yeah. And he'd stay in his room with me until he come back. Just lovely, respectful, nice, yeah, gentle. Yeah, like, like, like I'm sitting here with you, Joe. Just talking away, you yeah. know, watch the news, you've seen this today, you've seen him, yeah. what you've been up to, you've gone away the weekend, all this stuff. Yeah. And yeah. he had a nice wife, didn't he? He did, Lucy was a lovely woman. Yeah. But we didn't know what was going on behind closed doors, did we? Nice children. Yeah, three lovely children. Yeah. No, no, exactly. We didn't know what was going on behind closed doors. Oh. Um, everything seemed to be normal. What, what he was he, to you, he was the boy next door. And even when, because you, because of part of the investigation, because you was his neighbour and you knew him well, you and John, yeah, um, John being my father and all since passed on, bless him, 2020. Um, but with being your neighbours, I had to do compulsory interviews, and me being somebody who knew him quite well. I, I, I run investigated with the Serious Crime Squad of London, so did you, and the Surrey Murder Squad. But even when they charged him, you didn't believe it, did you? No, I didn't. I said to the man, there's no way he could do things like that. 
Yeah. 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 Well, you knew him as an ice star. Yeah. You knew him as an ice star, John. Yeah, well, I said that he, I knew him as a. Um, I was just been explaining, you know, on the camera. If he had hundred pound, he'd give fifty one pound at least, wouldn't he? Yeah. He yeah, was one hundred percent. He would. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, he's come away with me on, on caravan trips, and he's been away with you. A couple of days here and there on, on camping trips, and he's a nice fellow, wasn't he? Was he didn't see any of that, do we? No, he and, went down to Laystown, didn't he? Yeah, and he, but he had quite good. Um, was he had he had a laugh and a joke, wasn't he? A good sense of humour, didn't he? Yeah. And he was doing a bit of boxing out there in his garden. Yeah. Remember training when you yeah. were doing the boxing? Yeah, he was trying to do a bit of that when he had to go on the unlicensed. And that, but. When it was time for him to go boxing, he made out he was ill, didn't he? <laughs> oh, he started quitting because you, he had all the all marks. This yeah. is what I, I thought, you thought the same as me. He had all the all marks of somebody who didn't have the bottle. That's didn't right. you tell me the story when um, Grandad um, went out the back when your husband was cutting open the rabbit, skinning the rabbit because he's old fashioned, he liked that sort of food. Yeah. And what happened with Levi, didn't he? He was out the back watching John skinning it and taking the stomach out of it and cutting it yeah yeah and washing it to cook to yeah. make a stew with yeah yeah and it made him ill he just spewed up he couldn't watch Did it he's like i can't do how can you do that john he said that's very oh oh that's awful he said why are you doing that like that he said do you like stew he said of course i do he said well that's going in the pot of stew in a minute so it's, a, so it's amazing, he, he, he didn't have the bottle to see a rabbit skin, but he could kill innocent girls and women, surely. Yeah, but you know what he used to do, though? He didn't hit them face to face, did he? He hit them at the back of the head, didn't he, with an hammer or something? That's right, he used to hit them from behind, un unawares. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. he didn't see what he was... He, he, he'd done them girls, which they was lovely girls, weren't they? Oh, beautiful young girls. And, uh, he and one was a child, I, wasn't she? I don't know why he ever done that to them girls, because he, I can't, it was un, but it's impossible to see that he could do that. Yeah. Because he didn't seem that sort of fella. And then when we had the interview with the man that come here. What, the police, yeah? Yeah, the police, yeah. Yeah. Well, he wasn't the police, he was the head man up at Scotland Yard. Yeah, Ed, 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 yeah. Ed Murder Squad, yeah. Him and another, and a lady. I questioned him and all, questioned us and how it's all here. But I, I said, no, I said, I think you've got the wrong man. I said, he couldn't do a thing like that. I said, I've got three young ladies here. I said, no, he, he never, ever said anything wrong to them. I said, but my husband did say, if you talk the way out of the way to my girls, he said, and I'm telling you, Neva, I'm warning you now, don't ever do that. He said, because I've got a rod out there drain one. He said, I'm going to put it straight up your back. He said, if you talk out of, my, out of the way to my girls. But he never did. But he never did. I suppose because because he, he used to have, behind the scenes, I think other women, didn't he? I suppose Grandad was maybe in fear, he'd maybe speak rude, but he forewarned him, but he never did. Because no. one of their your girls, obviously my wife. But he never ever spoke out of turn. There was no, nothing abnormal there. Yeah. And Grandad would have put the brain on up his back if he had, but he and never no, did. No, he didn't. Not yeah. to my girls, he no, didn't. No, he never did. Well, well not to many women he never, but certainly some he mistreated in the most horrible way imaginable. But and sometimes he wouldn't come home. Well, Maria said, why don't you go home, John, uh, Levi? He said, no, he said, John will be there. I won't bring you over bed. He said, because I'm frightened of him. I was scared of John's. Yeah. <laughs> so he like, spoke like, speak to that girl well as well, would he? Yeah. 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 Can you tell you all about yeah, him? Yeah. He used to stay, he spent more time there than he did in his own house. Yeah, so yeah. there's another friend he had. So this is the thing, this is the picture I'm trying to paint um, up the other side to the serial killer. When you say Jekyll and Hyde, I, think, I don't think, when you come, not many people are ever going to encounter a serial killer like we have, are they? No. They're not, but not, you're going to be, it's going to be one in a million, literally. To encounter a serial killer mm. like we both encountered you live next door um and i've because i live around the corner i was always around here to see yous and whatever um we had a jelly hill store up the road didn't we, we used to yeah. come to that we, yeah. just, we did trips together and they got little weekends and stuff yeah. um, but everything was so normal but i don't think you'd ever ever can get to grips with a jekyll and Hyde character like him where i was totally fooled 
You were totally fooled. Well, we all was, weren't we? Well, I thought like you thought. I didn't think he had the bottle to hurt anybody. And no, it was a Johnny, did he, my Johnny? No, we, we, we thought we thought he was too um, whingish and creepish and. Um, he used to be scared of John. I don't know why. He scared of most men, wasn't he? Yeah, he used to be really scared. He was scared of most men. That's what we thought. And when he had this ego thing, wanted to do a bit of boxing. Um, and we, had, me, me and the granddad found it as a bit of a laugh, really, didn't we? Mm. But he went this egotistic thing where he wanted to be one of the boys. And yeah. he was a nice fellow, we thought, but he was never going to be one of the boys as an old man or a bit of a boy, was he? He was never going no, to be no, that, was he? He never had to bottle to do the boxing, really, did he? Because when it was time for him to go boxing, and you had him on the show... He pulled out three times, didn't yeah, he? he pulled out, and the last time... He once he out, did go have a dough, he wouldn't stop holding and trying to web butt the bloke, when he was right <laughs> <the boy. laughs> Oh, he was funny in ways, and he was a funny fella, but... Well, he was a comical fella, he could yeah. make you laugh some ways, couldn't he? Yeah, and he'd go out here in the mornings out of his house, he'd, he'd have a long cranberry overcoat on, Yeah. and a nice white shirt and a briefcase, and away he'd go, walking, we thought he'd go to work. Yeah, he looked, he looked the part, he could play many parts, couldn't he? Yes, he could. And clearly, he played the part of a serial killer, but we didn't know. But what he was very good at, the police said, what he was brilliant, there was two reasons he evaded the police. One, he was very, very clever. Even to the day he got arrested, there was no forensic test. He got caught on by camera. Yeah, he got caught, caught by on, on camera um, when Emily Dollar Grange got killed in Twickenham. Mm -hmm. He got caught on camera, that was the only thing, but there was no circuit, there was no forensic evidence. He was very clever, he could play that part, he could play a businessman, he could play this, he could play he could lots play, of parts. He could play a crook or he could play a gentleman. Now like my Johnny was taking the dogs down that road for a walk, she had two greyhounds there. And when he got down the bottom, the police pulled, Adley guy pulled him up, right, in the car. And John went up there and he wasn't going to see Levi or the police, he was just going round to walk the dog. And, the, and he said, you're right, John. Well, as soon as Levi said that, they wanted to interview John, do you know what I mean? Do you know this man? Yes, he yeah. said, he's my neighbour. He said, uh, what have you got him in the motor for? He said, that's our business, you know. He said, we don't discuss that. But he said, no, but I've got to go now. He said, I've got to walk my dogs. Anyway, when he was walking the dog, the man said, you're not going. He said, I want to interview you about Levi. And then they started talking, he said, look, mate, he said, whatever Levi's done, it's nothing to do with me. And we, we are good friends at the moment. But he said, I don't know what you've got him in that moment for. Anyway, but he had a load of drugs and that stuff, what he weighed in, you know? Did he? He had little scales. There you go. So these were the, you know, these were the sort of crime. Um, it turned out, didn't he also have a bag of dodgy money one day and he got off with that a big load of um what do you call it snide money um it wasn't counterfeit it was a counter was it counterfeit no, no, he'd come in here with it right he'd so i remember granddad john saying for what he's been done for he's facing a lot of prison and the next thing we knew he was out weren't he yeah he's walking back so then we started to think how's he getting away with this now um granddad was a straight worker so he had to fear. I was um, a debt collector, but my, 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 my debts were only, they weren't gambling debts or drug debts, my debts were only businessmen. So when there's businesses pretending to fold and to knock other people or go in and get the money back. So my business was fairly straight. I was, um, that was what my job was in a boxing promoter. So I had nothing um, to fear in that field, mm -hmm. neither did granddad. But we then straight away thought, well, hold on a minute, he could be um, a bit of a grass here. And it turned out, when it all become revealed, one of the reasons he had kept, evaded the police's radar for so long was because the mere fact that he was a police informant. Yeah. Which it turned out, that's another thing we didn't know about him yet. Well, he got, the police got him about three or four times up the road for things we didn't know what he was doing. And he always slipped the noose. But he always come back. after he, Yeah. That's his not this so, time, George. I said they're going to take him. He's going to get five or six years here, you think. come back, and he'd come back. So he, this is for the viewers at home. This is one of the reasons he evaded capture so long. He was a police informant. Well, of course, they had him on their books and they wanted somebody they were looking at. They were only looking at him for information, yeah? yeah? Which you, God knows how many people he got in trouble for trading information, that we don't know. But what we do know is that's why he was evading, he wasn't on the radar. And one thing 
when the penny dropped, um, when it finally come to light, uh, was actually next door, we was done a party, um, I think you were there as well, and he said we're having a New Year's Eve party, and if you remember early on, yeah, when I was back over um, London Borough of Elmslow, and the young girl at Strawberry Hill, and got struck at the back of the head, they thought she slipped on ice. But this is where the penny dropped, because it's a memorable day. New Year's Eve, party around Levi's house. So we all went up an old fashioned party. You remember that, Joyce, yeah? And um, I remember his auntie lost a daughter in his Abriga disaster, the boat disaster, was mm -hmm. chatting to her. And we're just in an old house party, just a normal old fashioned old school house party. And I went round about nine o'clock, 10 o'clock comes, 11 o'clock comes, 12 o'clock comes. And I said, where's Levi at? And I said, he's hosted the party, his wife was there, he's not there, it turns in about half past midnight. So I said to him, because I could talk to him in this manner, where the fuck have you been? You go to the party, you're not even here, what's going on? He was dressed really nicely, and he said, I've been on the door, work's gone wrong, and he seemed in a right bad mood. He had a go at his old auntie, and I said, don't have a go at her, she's been through enough as it is. What is wrong with you? And then he sort of calmed down, he said, I've had a difficult night at work. So then I get interviewed by the, the Serious Crime Squad um, from Barnes and Surrey Police uh, Murder Squad and they mention bang, 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 all the attacks, all the things and bang, the penny dropped. The, the time the penny dropped, the only and first time I knew I put two and two together, come up with four, is when he attacked the young girl at Strawberry Hill, Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, and he come back in a mood about half an hour consistent with the timing of the attack just to get home yeah across seven eight miles this side of london he had about the right amount of time and he come in in a foul mood and that's the only help i could ever give the police i said that's the only thing i know i said he come in and that's when the penny dropped I thought, oh that's why he's in a bad mood that's why he's hosted the party and he's not here he was driving around looking for somebody to attack mm -hmm. and he attacked this girl and where he was in a bad mood because he didn't kill her as intended or was he in a bad mood after he'd done these attacks mm -hmm. but that's when it finally <laughs> come and the final the final piece of this puzzle colin sutton the the mur the the um policeman that uh, led these investigation who brought him to justice the paints different pictures but my brother was a second hand car dealer van dealer and um we got a friend on the london road in isleworth um a long long um old friend john he he sold my brother this van my brother then sold it to levi and what happened um he says the this colin sutton goes into my mate john's car lot the van lot and says who just sell that van to he said we've been here many many years this is not an armed robbery this is not um, parking fines, this is, he said, this is the murder of these innocent young women. He said, he's pleading and begging with John, he said, I need a straight answer. Who did you sell that Ford white van to? So incidentally then, he says, right, he makes a phone call, tells my brother where the land lies. My brother then phones me and says, asked him for me advice, he said, the old Bill are looking to know who I've sold the van to. He said, and the policeman knows John over the years. He said, and he's promised him faithfully. It's in connection with the murders of the girls. So I said, well, you're going to have to tell him who you sold it to. I said, because it's obviously not Levi. I said, they just eliminate Levi. I said, go about his business. I said, then, uh, and then help him catch the real killer. So he then went, right, is that the thing to do? I said, it's the only thing to do. There's somebody investigating the murders of these innocent girls and children. And he went, yeah, I sold it to Levi Belfield. And the policeman went, bang, it's just what we want to know. And that was the van seen near Twickenham Green, Emily Dolly Barnes. And that was the final piece of evidence. If my brother never said Levi Belfield, yeah, that may have stalled it. Um, but, you know, it was probably eventually. But that was the final piece of evidence that got him arrested yeah. and um and what i could not the penny dropped on that night at the party for me new year's eve come back in a mood timing bang that attack other than that i knew zero it was like a complete jekyll and i had no idea that side of him did you no no 
No. As far as I'm concerned, he was a really gentleman. He was a nice fella. When you found out what he was, yeah, did it make you a bit nervous looking back to what he potentially could have done to your yes, family? I thought myself, yeah, because I've got three daughters, haven't I? Yeah. I thought, no. And two of them are blonde. And my fit in his, Maria, fit in his description. He ran her up. And thing. young granddaughters growing up. Do you remember when he, he ran her up and told her to bring some petrol up where that house is where she used to live on that roundabout at one o'clock in the morning? She took petrol to him. There you go. So looking back then, you could have feared the worst. I don't know. And obviously, he never said anything to old girls, never done anything. Um, no, he didn't. He was but, wrong. But on the same token, with the warning that Grandad gave him, threatened to put a drain run up his back, the punches round the head that I give him, um, and maybe your reputation um, of being a fighter, was that enough to deter him, or did he just not bring it alone? But one thing that stuck in my mind, we went out boxing in Hammersmith in the West End, and I wasn't fighting that night, and uh, I was on a show, introduced to the ring, um, nice show, and he was with us, and he disappeared for about an hour and a half, two hours. Now, Amersmith, right in the M4 corridor, straight down there, it's not far, that time of night, you can do it in 15 minutes or so. He disappeared for about an hour and a half. When I come home about half two in the morning, my wife said, I'm telling you now, somebody's been round the back of my house. I'm telling you now, the dogs have been going mad. And I always have such fears that my wife had went out to see that somebody- well, You like bronze, didn't you? Could it have been him laying wait? Mm -hmm. Things like that, probably never was, but these are the sort of things that play on your mind when you're so close to somebody who's a serial killer and that you didn't know.